Hi there. Um, today we're going to be looking at 11 to B. Um, yesterday we looked at um, algebraic techniques for evaluating limits. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, one-sided limits. But anyway, let's pool all of our techniques for evaluating a limit together as kind of a little review, okay? Um, first of all, it asks us to graphically approximate the limit by using a graphing calculator, okay? And the limit that we're looking at is the limit as x approaches 16 um, of 4 minus root x over x minus 16. So let's try that. Um, so we're going to put in here 4 minus the square root of x divided by um, x minus 16. And in my window, I'll make sure to go all the way up to 20. Maybe I'll go by, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll go by fives instead. <laughs> that doesn't look very good, does it? So maybe I need to make this a little bit smaller. So my y min, maybe I'll go from negative 1 to 1 and go by 0.1. Okay, that looks a little bit better. And so then graphically speaking... Um, what we do is we, like, so this is going by 5, so 5, 10, 15, 20. Um, we have this value um, starts here, and then it looks like it's just kind of getting closer, okay? But it looks like it's continuous, but if I put 16 in, I can see that um, it's going to be not continuous there, so there's probably going to be a removable discontinuity at that point. All right, and so if I'm looking here, if I like do a little trace, for example, and I'm going here, all right, let's see, as we go to 16, um, like here, if I'm bouncing back and forth between these values, it's like negative 0.125-ish, all right? So maybe it's about negative 0.125, um, okay? So that's graphically what we have. Um, numerically, we know that we can do that by constructing a table. And so to construct a table, what we're going to do is take x and y. And notice that this is 16 plus. So really what that means maybe we could do is instead of doing both sides, we could just start at 16 and then go to the values that are a little more than that. So 001, 01, 16.1, and you can do that. Um, and so I'll put this on. And so if I have 16, I know that that's going to be an error. Um, if I have 16.001, negative 0.125, 16.01, negative 0.125, negative 0.125. And I know you're like, why is it like that? But remember um, that this probably is not able to get the number of decimals that are required, okay? But here we can see that this is also going to be 0.125. But let's also find what this is going to be algebraically, okay? Because um, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're not relying on our graphing calculators for, to do this. So what we'll do is we're going to find the limit of 4 minus root x over x minus 16 as x approaches 16. And one of the tactics that we looked at was rationalizing our numerator. And so if we multiply by 4 plus root x in the numerator and the denominator. That gives me the limit. Um, this will give me 16 minus x, and then over x minus 16 times that 4 plus root x. One of the things that we noticed is that when we have 16 minus x and x minus 16, these are just different by a factor of negative 1. So then I end up with the limit as x approaches 16 of negative 1 over 4 plus root x. 
And at this point, now I could probably evaluate. I can use direct substitution. So use direct substitution. And I get negative 1 over 4 plus the square root of 16. So that's negative 1 over 4 plus 4, which is going to be negative 1 eighth which again is that negative 0.125 that we saw, okay? So um, these are some different ways that we looked at the limits. But again, I wanna point out that this is looking at 16 plus, and that 16 plus really means 16 to the right. It means to the right of 16, so numbers that are bigger than 16. And that brings us to this idea of um, our one-sided limits, okay? So in the first section, Okay. We saw that one way a function will not have a limit is if a function approaches a different value from the left side of C as it does from the right side of C. Okay. In order to have a limit at a specific value, they had to match. Okay. But could we have what's considered a one-sided limit? And that answer is yes. So this is going to graph the function and find the limit if it exists. And this is going to be this piecewise function. And so if I look here, I'm going to graph x minus 1 um, if x is less than or equal to 2. So if I put 2 in, 2 minus 1 is 1. So I can start at 2, 1. And then I can pick some other values. 1 minus 1 is 0. Um, and basically, I can tell that this is just going to be a line with a... Um, slope of negative 1 that goes down this way. We can have a closed circle here. And then we have 2x plus 1 if x is greater than 2. So if I put 2 in here, 2 times 2 is 4 plus 1 is 5. So that means that 2, 5, I could have an open circle. And then if I put in 3, that gives me 7. If I put in 4, that gives me 9. So it looks something like this. And if we looked, for example, at the limit of f of x as x approaches 2, we see that from the left side and the right side, they do not match. So what we see is that this limit does not exist. And remember that this is an example of a jump discontinuity. And the limit as x approaches 2 does not exist because of that jump discontinuity. However, I want us to look at what they're looking at here. This is asking us to find the limit as x approaches 2, and that plus means from the right. Okay, or basically on the right side of 2. Okay. And if we look on the right side of 2 only, we can see that it does approach this specific value where there was this hole. That on the right side of 2, as x is approaching 2, basically from the right, then that means that our limit would be 5. Similarly, if we have um, the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 and we see that little negative side, this really means from the left, or basically we look on the left side of 2. We'll ignore the right side, and we can see that as we go from the left and we approach x equals 2, that our function is approaching 1. Okay, um, And so... These are these one-sided limits. And so before, we said that in order to have a limit that they had to match. That's true if we're having the limit at a specific value. But if we have a one-sided limit and we have something like a jump discontinuity, then they can exist. We'll make a note of that in a second as well. Okay? So here's the issue, is that, um, or the idea of this existence of a limit. If f is a function and c which is the value that x is approaching, and l are real numbers, l is the limit we're trying to get to, then that is true. The limit of f of x as x approaches c is l if and only if both the left 
and right limits exist and are equal to each other, okay? So here, a right limit exists, a left limit exists, but they're not equal to each other. So that's why this limit does not exist, okay? So one-sided limits can be fine, but if we have two one-sided limits that give us the same value, that tells us that the actual limit exists, which is kind of a neat thing, okay? So this asks us to use the graph provided and then to determine the limit or the function value, okay? Um, I do just wanna make that note here that one-sided limits can exist at a jump discontinuities. Okay, so in the example that we did here in example two, one-sided limits existed at the jump discontinuities, but because there were different one-sided limits, that's why the limit just at two didn't exist. Okay, so again, it says use the graph provided, determine the limit or the function value. And so in letter A, this one is asking us for the limit as X approaches negative one but then from the left. So if I look here, I'm looking, here's where x equals negative one, and I'm approaching it from the left. And I can see that from the left, it's going towards this value of one, okay? Now let's look at what's happening in letter B. This one wants us to approach negative one from the right. So here's where x is negative one, Let's approach it from the right. Well, from the right, there is a little hole here, but from the right, it's approaching this value at negative two. Okay. So therefore, what is the limit of h of x as x approaches negative one? Well, did these match? They didn't. So that means that the limit at, um, as x approaches negative one does not exist. Okay. Now what about h of negative one? Just because the limit doesn't exist, does that mean that we can't have a function value? Remember those didn't have anything to do with each other. Essentially, do we have a closed circle at um, x equals negative one? We did, we had a closed circle right here. When x was negative one, the value of the function was one, okay? So again, that's where that closed circle was. And so because there was that closed circle that was there, then we can say that the function value does exist. And again, here's a case where the value of the function can exist, but the limit doesn't necessarily exist, okay? Um, let's try another one. Let's look at um, x approaches three. Um, and here we're approaching three, again, from the left. So as x, here's where x equals three. So from the left, we can see that it's going towards this um, value here that looks like that's at two. Letter F is asking us to approach three from the right. So that looks like it's going to one, two, three. And so notice that these one-sided limits don't match, which means that the limit of h of x as x approaches three does not exist. Now, just because the limit doesn't exist, that doesn't mean that h of three doesn't exist. We do have a closed circle when x equals three, we can see that our value is two. Again, I don't know if you need to make that note again that this was a closed circle, okay? So that's kind of the scoop on um, using graphs to look at those one-sided limits, okay? All right. Um, so next this says to use a graphing calculator to graph the function and to determine the one-sided limit or determine the limit if it exists by evaluating the corresponding one-sided limits. And then we'll write an approximation that's accurate. We're gonna to try to go to three decimal places, okay? So in number four, this wants us to find the limit. So we'll go back into our graphing calculators. Get rid of that screen. Um, we're gonna take one over 
x squared plus 1. And if we look at substituting 1 in by direct substitution, notice there's not an issue. Like, we don't have an issue with um, any sort of discontinuity, okay? So we can see that at x equals 1, that our function is going to be well-behaved. If we wanted to look at what that looked like graphically, I'll just zoom 6 this one, okay? And what we can see is our graph looks something like this, okay? But what we know is that at x equals 1, um, we can say that the function is well-behaved. Sometimes we'll say that. Essentially, it's like continuous. There's not any sort of discontinuity that we can um, deal with. So what we can do is just use direct substitution. Okay. And if I use direct substitution, that means that I can just put 1 in place of x. So that gives me 1 over 1 plus 1, which is 1 half. Okay. So what that means here is that we'll say that our limit is equal to 0.5 or 1 half. Okay. All right, number 5. We have the limit of this time in our numerator, we're going to put the absolute value of x minus 6. And we're going to divide that by x minus 6 itself. And if I graph this, and so here's where x equals 6. I see that, um, I know that if I put 6 in, that's going to be an issue, right? Um, so I have an open circle, and we're going to the right here. And then here I have an open circle, we're going to the left here. And it looks like this is at 1, and this is at negative 1, okay? So if I try to use um, direct substitution, there's a problem, because if I put 6 in, that's an issue, right? So I can see that at x equals 6, oops, at x equals 6, there's a jump discontinuity. And so because there's a, just a jump discontinuity, that means that we're going to have to use the graph or the table. Okay. And this one was pretty clear, in my opinion. This is looking at 6 from the left. And so if I look at 6 from the left, I can see that on the left side of 6 that we are, like all these values are negative 1. So again, I'm going to use the graph and I can basically like look at the left side, right? And I can see that this is going to be negative 1. Okay. What if it was 6 on the right? Then it would be positive 1. What if it was just plain 6? doesn't exist. Okay, great. Okay, so let's do one more like this. Um, this last one that we can graph is going to have 1 minus the cube root of x over 1 minus x. Again, um, if you don't want to use the cube root, you can always use x to the one third. That will work as well. Okay, and this isn't, uh, maybe I should can adjust my window a little bit so it's a little closer. Maybe I'll just go on my x's, maybe from, maybe I'll go from negative 2 to 2, and then my y's, maybe negative 2 to 2. Let me try that. Oh, goodness, that's an interesting graph, huh? And when I'm going so close on, um, on my fancy calculator here, you can, like, see the whole Kind of cool. All right, um, because we can see if we put 1 in that that's going to be dividing by 0, which is going to be an issue, right? So if we kind of look at the shape of this graph, we're going up like this, we go down like this, and then it looks like there's some sort of hole here, okay? It does look like it's a removable discontinuity. So what that means is that we would be able to find the limit you know, probably the limit itself. Um, but this is just asking us for the limit as x approaches 1 
from the left. And so again, we're just looking at what's happening on the left-hand side. Okay. We'll just make a little note that at x equals 1, there's a removable discontinuity. So we can use either the graph or the table. Okay. And what I could do is if I go to the graph and I like try to trace from the left hand side, um, what you can do is you can kind of see how those values are getting closer and closer. So like here it's 0.96 and then it's um, very close to 0.33. So what we could do is we could use our table like we did before and get very close. So in our table, we could go, for example, at 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999. Let me do another one since I have the room. And you can see that these values get closer and closer and closer to one third or um, 0.3, repeating. And so this says to round to three decimal places. So we're not sure. So we'll just say that that's going to be about 0.333. Okay. All right. So that's a little bit about the one-sided limits. Um, and then just kind of using the graphing calculator and these different tactics for us to find those. Okay. The last thing we're going to do today is going to look at the idea of the difference quotient. Okay. The difference quotient is something that we've talked about before, and it is like the staple of being able to take derivatives in calculus. This is what our difference quotient is. It's when we have f of x plus h minus f of x over h. But one construct that we have here is that our h cannot be zero. This is what our difference quotient is. This is definitely something that you're going to want to memorize, okay? Um, this is something that we'll be using a lot, particularly in the next couple sections, okay? Um, so let me kind of give you an idea of what's going to be happening here. Um, so what we have is, let's say that you have this function f of x. I'm just going to draw like, pretend that it's a line. And I'm going to say that this is f of x. Okay. And I'm going to have a point here that is x. And so what that means is that this point that's on the line then it would be x, f of x, essentially, right? I put in x, I get f of x. Okay. The idea of the difference quotient is that we're going to have go some arbitrary length over h units. So now this value would be x plus h. And so what that means is that this point on the line has an x value of x plus h and a y value of f of x plus h. Because again, to get the y value, we just substitute the x value in, okay? And so what we're really looking at is this is really just the slope of this line. So let me try to... Um, demonstrate to you like what we have as the slope. I'll just kind of put that down here. If we think about the slope of the line, what that is, is that is f of x plus h minus f of x. Okay, change in y over change in x over x plus h minus x. So change in y over change in x. And then do you see that the x's cancel? And then we're just left with f of x plus h minus f of x over h. That's really what this is. The difference quotient is really the slope, which we'll get more into in the next section. Okay, um, but that's if you're like, what the heck is the difference quotient? That's what it is, and that's kind of why it's important is because it helps us find slopes, okay? But for right now, we're just going to practice the idea of the difference quotient, okay? So just bear with me, and um, then we'll do fun stuff with it in the next section. So this is asking us to 
sorry, I pressed stop by accident. It's asking us to find the difference quotient for each function and then find the limit as h approaches zero, all right? So um, in the difference quotient, we need to use find f of x plus h. Sometimes f of x plus h is gonna be really pretty. Sometimes it's not. So what I try to do, especially in the beginning, so my problem isn't like, so long. Um, I usually try to find what f of x plus h is. And we know that to find f of x plus h, we just put x plus h in place of x. So here, that's not that big of a deal. That's just going to be x plus h minus 2. Boom. Okay? All right. So then the next thing is let's actually find the difference quotient. Okay? So my difference quotient, dq, not Dairy Queen, unfortunately, okay, is going to be, remember, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So let's put that here. We just found that f of x plus h is the square root of x plus h minus 2. I know here that f of x is the square root of x minus 2. And then this is going to be um, h, essentially. Okay? So this is the difference quotient. That's it. Okay? That's your difference quotient. It's not very cute, is it? Okay. The magic is going to happen when we find the limit as h approaches 0 of the difference quotient. So we're going to take the limit as h approaches 0 of what I got up here. So I'm going to take the limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of x plus h minus 2 minus the square root of x minus 2 all over h. Now we've learned in our other previous sections, or actually earlier this section, that one of the ways that we can simplify this is by rationalizing the numerator. So we can multiply by the square root of x plus h minus 2 plus the square root of x minus 2. And then of course do that in both the numerator and the denominator to rationalize. And so then if we multiply these together, Again, I need to keep the limit notation throughout. Um, I'm going to use the difference of two squares, so that, or um, sorry, the um, sum and product. So I'm going to have x plus h minus 2 minus x minus 2. Again, this squared minus this squared, okay? And then all over this h times root x plus h minus 2 plus root x minus 2, okay? So let's see how this simplifies. Here I can see that this negative is going to distribute to the x. So I'm going to have x minus x, so those cancel. Then this negative is also going to distribute to the negative 2, so I'm going to have negative 2 minus 2, uh, plus 2. And so what that means is that in my numerator, I just have h over h times root x plus h minus 2 plus root x minus 2. Hopefully you guys see that I can cancel these h's. And so I end up with the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 over the square root of x plus h minus 2 plus root x minus 2. Okay, so I have this, um, I you know, do my simplifications, and now at this point, if uh, the reason that we couldn't use direct substitution right away is because there was a zero in the denominator. Now notice that I've, I don't want to say cleaned it up, but I've rewritten it so that that's not going to be the case. So then that's really what we're going to do next, is we're going to use the direct substitution. And we're going to put um, that value in. So we're going to have 1 over... Um, and then we're going to have x plus 0 minus 2 plus x minus 2. Oh, just with the square root, sorry, I didn't say those out loud. So then essentially we have 1 over root x minus 2 plus root x minus 2. And then do we see that these are the same? So essentially that we have 1 over 2 times root x minus 2. And that is going to be my limit of the difference quotient as h approaches 0, okay? So notice here we end up, when we use the difference quotient, we end up with expressions instead of single values, but that's okay, I promise, all right? 
And let's try one more in number eight. Um, so in number eight, um, again, we're going to find the difference quotient and then we'll find the limit as H approaches um, zero. So in the last question, F of X plus H wasn't that big of a deal. But I want you to see what happens in this question. Notice that if I put X plus H in, I have four minus two times X plus H minus X plus H quantity squared. Oof. That would be a lot to like go through the difference quotient with all of that. That's why sometimes I like to find what f of x plus h is on its own. So to do some of that distribution. So this gives me minus 2x minus 2h. Then if I square x plus h squared, that's going to be x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Um, then I need to make sure to distribute this negative everywhere. So I have 4 minus 2x minus 2h minus x squared minus 2xh minus h squared. So that's what f of x plus h is. And that's why I kind of like to do it off to the side, just so I don't have to like do all those steps over and over and over again in the difference quotient. Okay. Speaking of the difference quotient, let's find what that is. So our difference quotient is going to be f of x plus h, which we found here was... 4 minus 2x minus 2h minus x squared minus 2xh minus h squared minus f of x, which is this 4 minus 2x minus x squared all over h. Okay? Remember, I'll be distributing this negative. So that's going to be 4 and a minus 4. Those will cancel. This will end up being plus 2x. That'll cancel with this negative 2x. And this negative x squared, negative negative x squared, will cancel here as well. So all of those end up canceling out. So I end up with negative 2h minus 2xh minus h squared over h. Okay? Now, I can't combine any of these terms, but I notice that these each have a factor of h I could cancel out. So I'm going to factor out an h, and that gives me negative 2 minus 2x minus h all over h. So I can cancel that. So my difference quotient is negative 2 minus 2x minus h. The order doesn't matter. I don't care. Okay? So now what we're going to do is take the limit. We're going to take the limit of negative 2 minus 2x minus h as h approaches 0. Now the nice thing is, is that this is really all set for direct substitution, right? Um, we're all ready to use direct substitution because putting 0 in isn't an issue. So I have negative 2 minus 2x minus 0, which essentially gives me negative 2x minus 2, okay? So again, just a little note that when we do the difference quotient questions and we're doing these um, limits, that what we do is we get expressions instead of single values, okay? And that's fine. And I can't wait um, to talk to you about what these really mean going forward, okay? So that's the thing with the difference quotient is that instead of an answer like 1 32nd, you're gonna get something like one over two times uh, root x minus two, okay? So that is a little bit about 11 2 b I hope you guys have a great day, bye.